It is my great pleasure to welcome to John Jay College, Pete Seeger. Pete Seeger is a living legend. You here are very fortunate to be able to, at the very least, meet this man and share with him for this class because Pete Seeger is a living legend. He is single, the single, perhaps the single most important figure in folk music and the development of that whole arm of America's culture over the last 50 years. And if I, in, in introducing Pete, I would like to highlight three things. And the first is just that, that I think that I would be right in saying that first and foremost, Pete loves music. I think this, if we were to define him, I think that's where we would need to start. A man who has loved and lived music all his life. And that's important uh, because he has not just loved it and lived it, but he has advanced it. He has taken it many steps further. Uh, and we, I'm sure you will have many questions to ask about that aspect of his life, the business of the folk music development, and I'm sure that Pete will be talking somewhat about that. The second area in which Pete's impact has been national and international is in the area of championing the cause of labor, championing the cause of labor in this country and in the world, the workers. There is no worker, there is no union, there is no labor organization in this world that does not have a debt to pay to Pete Seeger. There have been many occasions when he has put his life on the line, standing out in front with his guitar, a very formidable instrument, or his banjo, which is even more so, as he will soon show you, because the banjo has some interesting things on it. And his championing of labor has been uh, 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 most uh, profound and a, a very, very strong aspect of his life. And the third thing which I thought I would highlight to you is that Pete also was in the forefront of the civil rights movement in this country in a time when it was not fashionable to be there. S Pete was in the forefront. And many, many of the songs that we associate with that time were developed and promoted and projected by Pete Seeger. And so I'm going to turn it over to Pete and ask him to share with us some of those times. You are indeed fortunate that we now have in our presence to address us a living legend. Let's hear it. Thank you very much, Jeffrey Fairweather. American song I, I know. It's a Native American love song 
Some anthropologist was in Miss Wisconsin and found some of the Menominee Indians still played the old cedar flutes. This is not a cedar flute. And uh, recorded them. I guess you realize that 20,000 years ago, your ancestors and mine, wherever they were on this earth, uh, knew just one kind of music. And there were so many different kinds. Uh, there's thousands of different kinds of music in the world. I suppose all the men knew the same hunting songs and warrior songs, and all the women knew the same lullabies or corn pounding songs, whatever. And then at various times around the world, some smart people invented uh, what they call agriculture. No longer did they have to hunt for animals, they could herd them in the fields. No longer have to walk for miles to find some tasty grains, they could grow them right in the backyard. And uh, all of a sudden, life changed in many ways. Now, there was usually a ruling class that owned the land and a lot of very poor people who did the work. The poor people had their own music they made. The rich people could afford to have music made for them. This is really the origin of the difference between fine arts music and, and other kinds of music. In Europe, it led to symphony orchestras in the castle. In Indonesia, it led to big, uh, what they call gamelan orchestras made of gongs. In West Africa, they had big drum orchestras. In the Imperial Court of Japan, they had weird flute orchestras, the gagaku orchestras, high-pitched flutes. And they sound kind of weird to us, but it was their music for them. A tendency of the fine arts music is to become very expert, but also it can get kind of dead and formal, too. And uh, the music which was played out in the huts of the peasants had a kind of earthy honesty about it. When cities came along, you found uh, some smart people finding they could make coins in the marketplace and they'd make music there. And uh, this was the beginning of pop music. And it changed whenever somebody had a, a good new idea, so everybody, others would copy it because they want to make, have coins too. And uh, pop music for a, a long time occupied a middle ground between fine arts music and folk music with a uh, pop music would swipe an idea from the castle or swipe a melody from out in the countryside and combine it. Now, of course, everything's all mixed up and it's a uh, millionaire could strum uh, an old song on a guitar or someone with much less money could uh, get a CD and listen to a symphony and often does. So the old definitions break down. Uh, all I know is that when I was a teenager, I first discovered there was a lot of good music in my country that I never heard on the radio. Uh, like most teenagers, I just knew what, what everybody else knew. Uh, I played tenor banjo in the school jazz band in 1933 and 34. I can tell you the pop songs of those days. Then my father took me to a mountain dance festival in Asheville, North Carolina, and I just fell head over heels in love with an instrument called a five-string banjo. Banjos were originally an African instrument. Over here they got popularized in the 1830s and 40s. That's why the old song, Strumming on the Old Banjo, Furthermore, I found out I could learn the history of my own country, literally the history of any, any country, by learning some of its songs. Uh, people made up songs about their own life. Cowboys made up songs about their horses and cows and their travels, and lumberjacks made up songs about working in the North Woods. And this was a railroad song which made up about 120 years ago, 
by some African-American building a tunnel in West Virginia. And as railroads got built around the country, the black railroad crews taught it to the white crews. This became a famous song among railroad folks. And then finally, in the, about 50 years ago, it got spread through the cities. John Henry was about two days old, sitting on his papa's knee. He picks up a hammer, a little piece of steel, and cried, a hammer's gonna be the death of me, Lord, Lord. Hammer's gonna be the death of me. Repeat that. Hammer's gonna be the death of me, Lord, Lord. Hammer's gonna be the death of me. Some of you are helping me, others keeping your academic objectivity. <laughs> John Henry said to his captain, a man ain't nothing but a man. But before I'd let your steam drill beat me down, I'd die with a hammer in my hand. Lord, Lord, I'd die with a hammer in my hand. Sing it again. I'd die with a hammer in my hand. Lord, Lord. Die with a hammer. John Henry hammered in the mountain. His hammer was striking fire. He worked so hard, he broke his poor heart, and he laid down his hammer and he died. Lord, Lord, he laid down his hammer and he died. Yes, he laid down his hammer and he died. Lord, Lord, he laid down his hammer and he died. Henry had a little baby, you could hold him in the palm of your hand. The last words I heard that poor boy say, my daddy was a steel driving man, Lord, Lord, my daddy was a steel driving man. Yes, my daddy was a steel driving man, Lord, Lord, my daddy was a steel driving man. Well, every Monday morning, when the bluebird begin to sing, you can hear John Henry a mile or more. You can hear John Henry's hammer ring, Lord, Lord. You can hear John Henry's hammer ring. You can hear John Henry's hammer ring, Lord, Lord. Hear John Henry's hammer ring. There's about 20 or 30 other verses, but you get the general idea. Needless to say, the music business and journalism like to oversimplify things. And uh, the average person thinks folk music is something you have to play with a banjo. And a folk singer is somebody who stands up on a microphone and sings. If there's an old grandmother singing some lullaby that she learned from her grandmother, oh, she's not a folk singer. She's not got a banjo. She's not standing on a stage in front of a microphone. <laughs> so. I try and persuade people, keep in mind there's as many kinds of folk songs as there are folks. I'm going to talk for another 10 or 15 minutes here, but then I'm going to ask for questions. And I really mean, uh, think of a question that can stump me. You might say, why the hell should I bother knowing what a bunch of old songs are about? What's that got to do with the present? It's a good question. Uh, Freud, the fellow inventor of psychoanalysis, is supposed to have said, the main way that people avoid trying to face up to their problems is the arts. And music is one of the principal ones. You have the illusion of beauty and freedom while the chains stay tight around your legs. There's certain truth in that. I don't agree with it completely, though, but it is true. Herbert Hoover, the president in 1929, when the crash was coming along, said to a 
pop singer named Rudy Vallée. Mr. Vallée, if you could sing a song that would make the American people forget the Depression, I'd give you a medal. And uh, there's still some musicians trying to get that kind of a medal. But some songs help you understand your problems. I really do believe this. Some arts can. There must be some people here who've read a book or seen a play or heard a joke or done something say, that, that hits the nail on the head. That, I've been trying to say that, and that says it just like I'd, it should be said. Occasionally, a song will come along which actually helps you do something about your problems. And uh, here's one of them. That's a I don't know if you realize the guitar came to Europe with the gypsies 700 years ago. Tar means string in the ancient Persian language. The zither also came from the east. Uh, the sitar went from Iran to India. It's a very popular instrument in India. Spain, though, loved the guitar, and when it conquered Mexico 500 years ago, Mexico got the guitar. USA picked a quarrel with Mexico in 1844 and got Texas and California. It also got the guitar. And the guitar got us. The guitar spread across the South. Now, it was not unknown in the North, but it wasn't really a people's instrument. It was kind of a parlor instrument for middle class people. But in the southern states, African people worked out a new way of playing it. In Europe, it had usually played <laughs> so on. But uh, they worked out a finger-picking style, like a bass drum in an African rhythm group. And then the index finger got the off. white people were learning this style of guitar, and now it's all around the world. Eric Clapton plays it, all sorts of people play it. You can play the melody at the same time as you get the harmony. There was a strike of tobacco workers in Charleston, South Carolina. The American Tobacco Company, about 300 workers, mostly women, mostly African American. And on the picket line, they used to sing gospel songs to keep the spirits up. There was one woman, Lucille Simmons. I only recently found her name. It was she who loved an old gospel song. Uh, usually called I'll Be All Right. I'll be all right. I'll be all right. I'll be all right someday. Deep in my heart, I do believe I'll be all right someday. Well, she liked to sing it slow. I don't know if any of you are from the Deep South, but you know you can sing any hymn slow or fast. It's usually called down there long meter style if you sing it very slowly. And uh, she changed one word. Because there was a verse that said, I'll overcome, I'll overcome. And she changed that one word and said, we will overcome. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I don't think she sang it with rhythm. Well, there was a white woman, a union organizer, learned the song from her. And a year or so later, up north, raising some money to help the union struggles, she taught it to me. I put it in a little 
magazine I'd helped to start called People's Songs in 1947 or 48. That time we called it We Will Overcome. Who exactly changed it from will to shall, I don't know. Uh, but shall opens up the mouth better. Ah, we shall. And in 1960, a young friend of mine named Guy Carawan was leading a weekend series of workshops called Singing in the Movement. There were some 70 young people from all across the South, Texas to Florida up to Virginia, and they sang songs to each other, taught each other songs, and Guy started singing this. And he'd given it uh, a particular rhythm. Uh, it's known in some churches, I guess it's in some songs out of Motown, you might call it the soul beat, whatever it was. They said, Guy, this is the song. And a month later, at the founding convention of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC for short, somebody hollered, Guy, teach everybody we shall overcome. My voice is down in the cellar. I hope you don't mind singing low. We I sometimes think every song is a triumph of oversimplification. Oh, someday, when is someday? Matter of fact, I knew uh, a friend of mine, the author Lillian Hellman, she says, someday, someday, what kind of a freedom song is that? Someday, someday. I told that story to Bernice Regan, who one they founded the group Sweet Honey in the Rock. She says, well, if we said we're going to overcome, overcome next week, what would we sing the week after next? <laughs> All I know is that this song reached people who had not been able to be reached any other way. They wouldn't have read a pamphlet if you'd given it to them. It reached all sorts of people, white as well as black, young and old. And it was only one of literally hundreds of freedom songs. Some of them were very fast and, and uh, full of jokes. Oh, oh, Wallace, you never can jail us. Oh, 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 oh Wallace, you know segregation bound to fall. Da -da 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 well, I read it in the papers da -da 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 -da, the other day. Da -da 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 -da. The freedom fighters da -da 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 -da, are on our way. Da -da 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 -da. So on. New words to a rock song called Kidnapper. That was 1965, a few years later. Well, I think I ought to quit my yakking for a moment and see if you have any questions. I'm serious. Try and find a question that means something, but you can ask me a trivial question if you want to. I don't mind. Raise your hand. Oh, you're scared. I'm ashamed of you. <laughs> Everybody's ashamed to be the first person. Somebody's got to be the first. Yes, good for you. Let's give them a applause. <laughs> yes. I'm sure they are, but which ones they are, I couldn't tell you. I know which are my favorite. Uh, there's an explosion of songwriting. I mean, every man and his brother and sister are uh, thinking, oh, I'm going to try writing a song too. And some of them are very lugubrious and solemn. Some of them are silly. Some of them are very complicated. Some are very simple. And I go on the general theory that the 
peak of a pyramid is as high as the base is broad. So if you get a lot of people making up songs, sooner or later there's going to be some real good songs out of those. But which ones are going to last 100 years, I couldn't predict. I know which are my favorites, uh, but uh, might not be somebody else's favorites. Any other question? Yes. Wait a minute, I did not understand you. I can only say what are my favorite songs, but keep in mind, if I was in China, most of the people say, these are, don't sound like favorite songs to me. I once tried to sing the song Guantanamera, teach it to a group of Chinese. It took them half an hour <laughs> because they, uh, in much of the China and Japan too, they're only just beginning to learn our African-American style of rhythm. I sometimes think their idea of rhythm is to drop a brick on the floor occasionally, but that's unfair. <laughs> but uh, they stuck with it. Finally, after half an hour, the kids were all singing Guantanamera with me, <laughs> tapping their feet. But it's very, very different. I mean, what's what one is one style of music, like the Irish, like long, slow melodies, as well as fast, rhythmic melodies. And uh, some traditions like a lot of rich harmony. South Africa, for, for example. When a young man and woman get married, it's traditional in South Africa for the friends of the bride to form a chorus and the friends of the groom to have a chorus. And when they have a chorus, they have basses and sopranos, all different voices harmonizing with each other. That's where that song you, uh, they call the Wimmerware comes from. If any of you heard of Lady Smith, Black Mombasa, you know what rich harmony they have there. So all I can say to in answer to your question, I know what my favorites, but I can't say what somebody else's is. Any other question? Yes. Speak loud. I really didn't, I get much more credit than I deserve. All I went down there and sang occasionally. Uh, my wife and I were on the march from Selma to Montgomery, sleeping in the tents and in the mud. We felt pretty well protected because there were uh, federal helicopters overhead uh, looking for people that might be in the neighboring cornfields going to shoot at us, but we felt pretty safe. There were several hundred of us walking down the road for several days. Funny thing is the only time we were in danger was after it was all over. Uh, we went to get a plane. I had to sing in Miami the following day and my wife and I were in the waiting room of the airport and suddenly we realized with our clothes full of mud and everything a lot of people would know where we had been for the last few days and she said be very careful when you go to the men's room will you? You'll be alone in there and unprotected. Uh, I remember I got off a plane once, and I'd been talking in my usual loose-lipped way uh, with a, a reporter from Life magazine, and I noticed the man in front of me, his body was stiffening. When he got off the plane, he said, he met me in the entrance to the airport. He says, you come down here to sing for the niggers? I said, I hope I can sing for everybody. He said, well, you, you, you better just watch your step. If we weren't here, I'd knock the shit out of you. <laughs> He's so mad. This goddamn Yankee coming down. <laughs> Any other question? I don't think so. Uh, Martin Luther King certainly gave it credit, said, the music kept us going in the darkest times. And it gave high spirits to what might have been a, a uh, really down situation. Uh, and, uh, well, here's a for instance. Somebody lands in jail, and uh, the other people already in the jail says, Oh, Alvin, where have you been? Alvin starts saying, Woke up this morning, and the whole gang woke up this morning with my eyes on freedom. I had new words to an old gospel song. I woke up this morning with my eyes on Jesus. And they just changed the words and had 
one verse after another. And they were singing there in jail. Kept the spirits up. I think I have no proof of it, I might say. There's no proof what songs can do. All I know is the powers that be are concerned. Plato is supposed to have written, it's very dangerous for the wrong kind of music to be allowed in the Republic. And there's an old Arab proverb, when the king puts the poet on his payroll, he cuts off the tongue of the poet. I think of that every time I get a job on TV. You probably know the Catholic Church tried to control the kind of songs that were going to be sung for a thousand years. It really got to be kind of foolish. A certain kind of a chord was illegal. They said it was the devil's chord. Until some clever composer wrote a very nice piece of music and the Pope loved it <laughs> and the composer pointed out that he'd used this chord over and over again. <laughs> and, and the Pope said, ah, really? Well, maybe that is kind of foolish. <laughs> Uh, I know that songs are kept off the air right now. Uh, they'll let a song with a lot of violence in it. There are a lot, a lot of songs with a lot of sex in it. Will they let a song like this be heard? Now, this is a silly little old song, but it, this song is hardly ever played on the radio here, but it happens to be so well known in Europe. It has a German translation. A lot of people think it's a German song. Last night I had the strangest dream I never dreamed before. I dreamed the world had all agreed to put an end to war. I dreamed I saw a mighty room filled with women and men. Is this mic still on? Yes. Okay. And the paper they were signing said they'd never fight again. It's a very Frank Peace song. And if you try and play this on the radio, the head of the station would say, oh, that's a propaganda song. Don't play that. Propaganda, propagus. It's the truth that's important. Now, where were we? Anybody got another question? You had a question? Who? Who else had a question? Yes. What? Yeah, China. Ah, well, I'm very proud that I helped. I'm one link in a chain which brought this song to the attention of the world. Like most Yankees, I knew so little about Latin America, it's silly. I heard the name Jose Marti. As far as I was concerned, he might have lived 100 years ago or 200 or 300 years ago. I didn't know who he was. Didn't know whether he lived in Argentina or Mexico, but he actually was uh, a Cuban, although his parents came from Spain. He uh, was very active in the liberation movement at age 16, was writing uh, essays and speeches and songs, and was exiled to leave Cuba at age 17. He went to Venezuela, came to USA, made his living as a journalist for 25 years. Very prolific writer. Wrote novels, plays, poems, polemics. And then in 1895, in an abortive attempt to have a revolution to free themselves from Spain, he was killed. And this is one of his last poems. Uh, rather, from the words of this song are from one of his last book, Versos Sencillos, Simple Verses. Now, in 1949, a classical composer was teaching piano to some students, a man that knew Beethoven and Bach and the rest, but he'd been uh, researching Cuban music. He'd been, his, his family had raised him in Spain, and he'd come back to Spain when Franco the dictator took over Spain in 1939. He'd come back to Cuba. And one day he said to his students, isn't it interesting? You know the pop song you hear every day on the radio? Josito sings it. He gets on the air, said, well, folks, this is Josito again. Here's the newspaper. Let's see who was caught sleeping with who. 
Let's see who is caught with his hand in the till. And he would improvise new verses to a tune called Guantanamera, which he'd made up about 20 years before, uh, satirizing the girls who went out with the sailors at Guantanamo, the American naval base. Guant Guantanamera was mainly known in those days as a song for men to sing when they get drunk. Where were you last night? Ha ha, Guantanamera. What were you doing? Ha ha, Guantanamera. Uh, but he said, isn't it interesting, Marti's philosophical verses fit this melody. If you just repeat the first two lines, and uh, 12 years later, one of his students was up in New York studying at the Manhattan School of Music, and he had a summer job at a children's camp in the Catskills. And I was singing at the for the children at the camp, most of my life I've made a living singing in schools and camps and sometimes in other places, but that's, I, st I like to sing for kids. And the kid says, oh, we learned a great song from our counselor. And they brought out this shy young Cuban. He teaches me the song. I said, well, I don't know Spanish, but it's got a nice chorus. Maybe I can teach people to sing it with me. I made a record of it. My record didn't sell particularly much, but other people learnt the songs off it, and this song went around the world. It's known o not just throughout Latin America, but I've sung it in 35 countries of this world, Asia and Africa as well as Europe and South America. And Marti's poems, poetic lines, they fit everywhere. <laughs> Yo soy un hombre sincero, de donde crecen las palmas, y antes de morir me quiero, echa mis versos del alma. Do you know it? Sing it. I gotta get this a little closer to my guitar. Mi verso es in a verde claro, y de un carmine sentido. Mi verso es in a verde claro, y de un carmine sentido. Mi verso es un siervo herido, e vos con el monte ampavo. Canta, Guantanamera, hey, hey, Bahia, Guantanamera, canta, solo, Guantanamera, Bahia, Guantanamera. Cultivo la rosa blanca en un yo como en enero, cultivo la rosa blanca. En un yo como en enero Para el amigo sincero Que me da su mano franca Y para el cruel que me arranca El corazón con que vivo Y para el cruel que me arranca El corazón con que vivo Lo que van Cardón y ortigo cultivo, cultivo la rosa blanca. Everybody! Guantanamera, hey, hey! Guajira, Guantanamera, hey, hey! Guantanamera, Guajira, Guantanamera. In case some of you here do not know Spanish, the words mean I am a truthful man from this land of palm trees. Before dying, I want to share these poems of my soul. My poems are light green, but they are also flaming red. I cultivate a white rose in June and in January for the friend who gives me his hand. 
and for the cruel one who would tear out this heart with which I live, I do not cultivate thistles nor nettles. I cultivate a white rose. And the last verse says, Con los pobres de la tierra, with the poor people of the world, I want to cast my lot. The little streams of the mountain please me more than the ocean. I often wondered what did he mean. Maybe he'd rather be in on the beginnings of things than the endings of things. I don't know. Con los pobres de la tierra Quiero yo mi suerte ya Con los pobres de la tierra Quiero yo mi suerte ya, el arroyo de la sierra me complace más que el mar. One more time. Guantanamera, hey, hey. Bajera, Guantanamera, hey, hey. Guantanamera, Bajera, Guantanamera. I visited Cuba, met Josito. He's dead now, but wonderful. No, he was a, he was, oh, if he was living now, he'd be over a hundred. He came out to the airport to meet me and improvised verses about Pete Seeger's come down to s see us in Cuba. And uh, we sang the song together. And later on, I did it on television in Havana. I was walking down the street the next day and a man about six stories up on a, building, painting this outside of a building or doing some repair work. He sees me, oh, Guantanamera. <laughs> <laughs> They're very proud that their song has gone around the world. I, uh, I copyrighted the song, not for the money for me, but to see that it wouldn't be misused. In uh, France, they made up typical uh, Baby, I Love You lyrics, and it took the young radicals to force the publisher to uh, give a decent translation or none. I've urged people not to translate it into English. You can't beat that Spanish, not with the English language at least. And uh, so the royalties are now mounting up in a New York bank because Washington won't allow them to be sent to Cuba. That's like $100,000 sitting in an escrow account in a New York bank to go to the family of Josito, who wrote the original uh, melody. However, maybe one of these centuries, the money can be sent to Cuba. Any other questions? How much time do we have anyway? Another 15 minutes, maybe? Now, people in back, you've been loafing. All my questions have been almost all from up front. Must be some questions back there. Ah, because it's obvious the world may not last more than 100 years. Uh, this whole world could be well-fed, well-housed, well-educated, but every year we spend billions upon billions upon billions on how to kill each other. It's the stupidest damn thing I can think of. And power-hungry men, and sometimes power-hungry women, are mainly to blame, and we allow them to do it. Well, so what can you do? I tell you what you can do. You can start organizing. It doesn't have to be on a big scale, but right on the block where you live, you could at least have a block party and uh, get the people of your block together. Up where I live, 60 miles away, we have a little club on the edge of the Hudson River. We call it the Beacon Sloop Club, named after the Sloop Clearwater. Do you realize the Hudson River 30 years ago, 25 years ago, was if you tried to swim in it, it would have been like swimming in a toilet bowl. Really? Guess where it went when you flushed the toilet? 
Today, you can swim in the upper reaches of the Hudson. If we keep pushing, it's going to be safe to swim in the Hudson around New York, but it's going to take some pushing. It doesn't happen by itself. We built a big sailboat 27 years ago, 28 years ago, and we called it Clearwater. People laughed at us. I was on the Johnny Carson show. He says, what's the name of this boat? I said, Clearwater. He says, on the Hudson. <laughs> Everybody laughed. But today, I call it a 50% cleanup with a 5% effort. We got a long ways to go. Uh, the big problem now is chemicals. They come from agriculture as well as industry. They come from the surface runoff. Somebody empties the oil in their car. They say, oh, what's a little oil matter? They dump it on the surface of the ground. Sooner or later, guess where it goes? So that uh, the ribbon is not as clean as it should be or will be. On the other hand, I tell people, 100 years from now, 200 at the most, this river is going to be clean as a whistle and up north beyond the salt line, you're going to be able to drink it. I'm positive of that. They say, how can you be so sure? Well, I say it can happen two ways. Either the human race will straighten up and fly right, we're going to get rid of militarism and sexism and ageism and racism and poverty and a whole lot of things, or we won't get rid of those things and there will be no human race here in a hundred years. In which case, the river's going to be clean as a whistle. <laughs> Any other question? That's how I feel optimistic. Yes, you have a question? Well, you haven't had a question yet. Yes. As what? In some ways, yes. In some ways, no. But you can't oversimplify it saying yes or no. Uh, I'm continually excited by the new music that I hear, even when it's made on synthesizers. I have a grandson, age 23, who plays electric guitar with me occasionally uh, when he's not busy trying to help the Clearwater. Right now he's repairing the boat so that they can go sailing again in April. But uh, So when you say is it better or worse, it's such a subjective thing that it, my answer, yes or no, wouldn't mean much. There's still a lot of crap on the radio, as you know. I don't listen to the radio much. I don't listen to TV much. Uh, if I want to make music, I get together with some friends and we make it ourselves. You had a question back there. Somebody raise your hand. Yes. Oh, sure. Oh, s like most folk music, it's, it's a part of its times and most of it will be forgotten, but you never can tell. Some person may throw off a line which can't be forgotten once you've heard it. Uh, some, some little phrase may be tossed off. And everything else been forgotten, but that one phrase <laughs> is unforgettable. But I, I couldn't predict which one. Somebody else had a question? You had a question. People are always writing things for the wrong reasons, th thinking they're going to get rich. One of the most foolish things in the world Money is like air and water, where you have to have a certain amount to live. But who wants to be a dog in the manger? Once you have enough to live, do you want to get more just to be powerful? Is that a really a sensible thing to want to get, to be powerful? Now, w it's true, people need power, but is, does an individual need power? I think the ideal would be getting together with a group and getting something done and to be individually powerful, like George uh, Soros is. You know who he is? He's an investor who makes bets on what the money of the world is going to do. He has about $12 billion at his disposal, some of it his own, some of it other people. He says, George, uh, I'm investing this with you. I trust you to make some money for me. On September 15th, 1993, he noticed that the German mark was going up or down, I don't know which, and it was going to affect the English pound sterling in a certain way. 
he bet all $12 billion on what was going to happen, and in one day he made, I won't say he earned, but he m was $1 billion richer at the end of that day. Now fortunately, somebody's got to him and said, how rich do you want to get? And uh, he's now spending most of his time talking with people around the world using uh, the fact that he's got this money to be able to talk to heads of state. And there's another man named Sir James Goldsmith. Ever hear of him? He only has a few hundred million. But he made them by buying and selling corporations. He wasn't interested in the corporation except as could he buy it cheap and sell it for more. And about five years ago, he quit cold turkey. I think his brother uh, helped persuade him. And he ran f to for election to the European Parliament and got elected. And he's come out with a book called The Trap, which is basically his political philosophy. He says, how is it that after 200 years of miraculous inventions, the wor the human race has more hungry people, more desperate people, more angry people, more dissatisfied people than ever. He said we've got to seriously look at what our system is doing and figure out how we can amend it, reform it, change it. He thinks that international trade, free trade, may look good on paper, the bottom line, some people get rich. But he says it's going to destroy nations and cultures all around the world. He says you can have international trade if the agreements are worked out carefully so that countries, peoples are not hurt too much. You don't want to put all the farmers out of business just because you can get some crop a little cheaper from another country. What are these farmers going to do? Are they going to starve to death? Uh, he v he's in favor of trade agreements, each being worked locally and w taking all things into account. But he says, beware things like GATT. Anybody know what GATT is? It's the International Trade agree uh, Agreements, G-A-T-T. And the big businessmen love it. Oh, free trade, freedom, freedom, freedom to get rich for a few people. Well, Sir James Goldsmith has written a book, if you want to look it up. It's called The Trap. It's very quick reading, and I think it's in the stores right now. It, was, it came off the press last year. It should still be there. Any other question? Yes? Do you think that country is ripe for another civilization? It's ripe for something, but I'm scared in a way because there are so many uh, angry people, and they're lashing out. You see, says those those people come up from South America, and they took my job, and actually think that by building a wall across uh, for two thousand miles from San Diego to to the Gulf of Mexico, that they can solve the problem. The way it'll be solved, of course, is to bring the standard of living up in Latin America. And then people won't have to leave their own country to, to have a decent life. But for a hundred years at least, the United States has mistrusted the people of Latin America. It says, oh, they're going to elect some radical who's going to make it hard on us. Better give some money to their generals. And for a hundred years, we've, we've given money to the generals of Latin America to keep their own people down. Gene Kirkpatrick called it we would rather have moderate authoritarianism. That's what you called it. I sang in Paraguay, Argentina, and Brazil, and Chile with my grandson last September. Uh, and uh, I think none of those countries are going to let moderate authoritarianism come back. They all had horrifying dictators uh, telling them what to do, murdering people, torturing people, kidnapping people some for 10 years, some for 30 years. And I don't think th the people will stand for it again. So I'm not as pessimistic as some are. But uh, what's going to happen up here? I don't know. I will say this. 
somebody comes along and is certain that there's no hope, I tell him, did you predict uh, that Nixon would have to leave office the way he did, you know, Watergate? He said, no, because it didn't. I said, did you predict the Pentagon would have to leave Vietnam the way it did? He said, no, I guess it didn't. I said, did you predict the Berlin Wall would come down so peacefully? Nope, I guess it didn't. I said, well, if you can't predict those three things, don't be so certain you can predict there is no hope. The human race has reserves of all sorts. And when the disaster stares us right in the face, often people who had never wanted to speak to each other found themselves finding a way to work together. And I have a, a bumper sticker that says, there's no hope, but I may be wrong. Yeah. Oh, yeah, music can bring hope. On the other hand, uh, I do know a friend of mine once said, hope is the greatest opiate. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. If you want to look into the any further into these kind of songs, I've put out numerous books. I'm going to leave them for the library here in the college. One is a book of uh, songs from the civil rights movement. Everybody says freedom. And it's got songs in there and the stories. Now there's a book of songs of working people of this country for 200 years from the early days of the 19th century, the first factory songs, uh, songs for the, you know, a hundred years ago, they were struggling for the eight-hour day. We've got the eight-hour day song in here. Oh, a nice word book. has 1,200 songs in it, just words and chords for guitar. This is our bestseller. It sold 200,000 copies. For people like us, that's big sale. When I say us, it's a little publishing company I helped to start called Sing Out. They have a quarterly magazine. And it gets news of a wide variety of different kinds of folk music. Uh, not just from this country, but somebody comes to this country from another country and, and gets heard around. They'll tell where they are. I have other books too, but right now uh, the book called Where Have All the Flowers Gone is out of print and won't be off. The second printing won't be off the press for another month or two. Any other questions? Oh. Uh, yes. I've sung it along with Peter Yarrow, but uh, that's all. And I've sung it for children. I've sung it for all sorts of people. Yeah, somebody else raise their hand. Yes. Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha. I'll tell you in November. Right now, it all depends what happens. I'm fascinated by Paul. I've voted in every election, but I confess usually I vote for an independent. I once voted for Dick Gregory for president. Uh, and sometimes, I, usually the person I vote for doesn't get elected. <laughs> but sometimes I vote for them and they get elected and then I'm sorry I voted for them. I voted for Johnson in 1964 and uh, thinking that he would uh, cool down the war in Vietnam. Ha, ha, ha. Yes. Puff the magic dragon. Listen, I don't have a voice. I, I treated my voice wrong for 50 years. I hollered. You heard that song, Weemaware? The guy who, I, who made the original record, he lost his voice too. <laughs> no other question? I wrote a kind of a musical autobiography called Where Have All the Flowers Gone, which is a song I wrote 40 years ago. I was sitting in an airplane, and I had three lines I'd copied out of a book, an old Russian folk song, Where are the flowers, the girls have picked them, where are the, where are the girls have all taken husbands? 
Where are the men? They're all in the army. I said, gee, that sounds like an interesting song. I should look it up. But I never did. Sitting in an airplane over Ohio in 1955 or 56, I suddenly thought of a line, long time passing. I'd, th I'd actually thought of it a while earlier and said, that would sing well. I found a way to, to combine this. And 20 minutes later, I had a, had a new song. Only had three verses, though. I sang it, and the head of the Oberlin College Folk Song Club had a summer job at that same summer camp up in the Catskills. And they were kidding around. Where have all the counselors gone? Broken curfew, everyone. But finally, at the end of the summer, they'd simmered down to where have the soldiers gone, gone to graveyards, and so on. The banjo has written around the edge of it a little slogan. I got it from Woody Guthrie, who was a little short, curly-headed guy from Oklahoma who wrote a song called This Land Is Your Land. And he and I used to bum around together back in the dirty 30s. And when he went into a hospital with an incurable disease, oh, oh uh, he went through World War II, rather, with a sign on his guitar, this machine kills fascists. He really wanted his guitar to help win the war against Hitler. But he kept the sign on after the war was over. We said, how come, Woody? Hitler's dead. Mussolini's dead. Tojo's dead. You can take the sign off. He says, no, this fascism comes along every time the rich people get the generals to help them stay in power. And that, frankly, is one of the things I'm worried about in the world today, because people get impatient and say, we need a strong man to bring order. But I think there's an awful lot of people, young and old, who say that old uh, Bill of Rights in the American Constitution was right. You got a right to speak your mind. And before I go, I'll sing you one of the Clearwater songs again. You have to help me. I say, sailing up, and you got to repeat it. Sailing up. I didn't. Sailing, up. sailing down. Sailing. After that, we reverse it. I say, up. You say, down. I say, down. You say, sailing up. Sailing down. Up. Down, up, up and down the river, sailing on, stopping all along the way. The river may be dirty now, but she's getting cleaner every day. Singing here, singing there, here, there, up and down the river, sailing on, stopping all along the way. The river may be dirty now, but she's getting cleaner every day. People go, come, go, up and down the river sailing, stopping all along the way. The river may be dirty now, but she's getting cleaner every day. Some are young, some are old, old, young, up and down the river sailing, stopping all along the way. The river may be dirty now, but she's getting cleaner every day. Catching fish, catching hell. Up and down the river sailing on, 
stopping all along the way. The river may be dirty now, but she's getting cleaner every day. One more time, sailing up, sailing down, up, down, up and down the river, sailing on, stopping all along the way. The river may be dirty now, but she's getting cleaner every day. Oh, sing that last line again. The river may be dirty now, but she's getting cleaner every day. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have. I'm sure we feel much better having experienced the magic of Pete Seeger. Um, and it is just a thrill to know that we have been able to share some of your own rich personal history. And I would hope that as good students that you will use this as a stimulus to do some further exploration on who this man is and what he has stood for and what he represents what he has been able to do and contribute to this country. So it's, uh, it's over to you now. There's no compulsion on this, but I'm sure that many of you will be interested to find out some more about this, some more about what really goes into the creation of someone like S Pete Seeger. Thank you very much, Pete. And thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have, I'm sure we feel much better having experienced the magic of Pete Seeger. Um, and it is just a thrill to know that we have been able to share some of your own rich personal history. And I would hope that as good students that you will use this as a stimulus to do some further exploration on who this man is and what he has stood for and what he represents, what he has been able to do and contribute to this country. So it's, uh, it's over to you now. There's no compulsion on this, but I'm sure that many of you will be interested to find out some more about this, some more about what really it goes into the creation of someone like S Pete Seeger. Thank you very much, Pete. And thanks for coming.